even though it's black, it used to be brown. Oh, you can taste the slime, but it's not bad. No? Okay. I'm gonna ask if don't have yeah. an answer. So we take water for granted. Water should be pretty straightforward, clear, odorless, tasteless to a degree. But you don't want water which is completely free of taste. You want to have some flavor in there. So if you have water that's free of taste, it becomes taste much bland and flat tasting. People who taste water will often say distilled water doesn't taste like much. So you want to have some minerals. You want to have sodium, magnesium, calcium, potassium, all these minerals in the right combination can create a really sweet tasting water. And that's what they're in search of. There was some that was grassy, some briny, some was, uh, well, we had a word for it, uh, vertitudinous. There was some that was uh, fishy, uh, all kinds of water. You'd be surprised how many different kinds of, you know, flavors of water there really, there really is. Some of them would have a subtle aftertaste. That'd be, as I say, sulfur. There might be a slightly bitter aftertaste. Uh, some might actually want to have a slightly burning aftertaste, which would be, it was, it was very subtle. If you drunk the water separately, you would never be able to tell one water from the other. Very unlikely you say, oh, I don't like that, oh, I don't like that. It's well, only when you taste them together in tandem like this that you get a chance to compare the tastes of the various waters. <laughs> well, water's big business. Yeah, when we started 10 years, 11 years ago, it was really new. And Quebec had just opened up and it was just beginning to roll. Do you get your water from a spring, natural spring? or? This, actually, this spring has been in my wife's family for over 200 years. We built a source, we built a plant, and we pipe it from the spring to the plant so it never touches air. Right. It goes right in the bottle. We're small, but, uh, you know, we we're, we're think we're really That's growing. wonderful. For the bottled water people, it's more of a commerce uh, benefit because, for example, we have some water here that has won and since then gone into distribution. And in some cases, the water has been distributed around the world as a result of this event. Compania Oaza. Компанија Оаза, Тешански киселјак, тоа е назив во воде. Што се тиче овој град, овој град сличен. The Berkeley Springs Prize was really huge for us. Last year, when we were awarded the gold medal, our water suddenly became popular. The world knows Bosnia because of the war, but no one knew we had a lot of good things going on. This country is rich with great mineral water. Bosnia won a gold medal. It was big news in in Eastern Europe. And so these other countries picked up on the idea from that and say, well, Bosnia can do it, we can do it too. Uh, Tajikistan, the people of Tajikistan realize the global problem of water, uh, the mere fact that over a billion people suffer from the lack of water. Uh, yeah, uh, Tajikistan has very bun abundant resources. The actual plant where this water is bottled is located right on top of the mountain, just where the river takes its beginning, the pure source of uh, melting mountain caps. So I would absolutely recommend this water to anybody as probably some of the cleanest, purest waters and also rarest waters available today, given the extent of pollution that we are observing around the world, one of the very few uh, virgin sources left to this day. And now people are looking at bottled water as a very important part of their overall beverage choices, and it's a $5.6 billion business in this country.
shepherds shear their sheep every year. Well, the wool is pretty dirty the sheep are out in, in, in the fields, you know, and lie down in the dirt. It takes a tremendous amount of water to wash the dirt out of this wool. And that's a great industry, requiring an enormous amount of water. It has to be washed not once, but many times. Another thing that we recover in the washing of this wool is animal fat. And this animal fat, these oils, are used to make byproducts. One of them, uh, believe it or not, is a face cream that you will find in my lady's boudoir. And another thing that we can make from these oils and fats that we recover in this way is the raw material to which we can add the phenol for the purpose of making plastic. Now this is sediment that we recovered in that fashion. It's mixed with one of the phenols, and this is a plastic plant. A mold and a press and presto. Comes a housing of any design that we have in the mold. Make dishes, make housing for cameras, or make anything of that kind. Now it may seem a simple thing to uh, back up water with a dam and hold it under control, but there's more to it than just building a dam across the river or a stream and getting a large still body of water. Because we uh, do many things with that water and we have to keep it under control in many ways. So we have funnels and plumes and valves and screens and uh, different uh, ways of handling it for various purposes. One thing that we do with these uh, great dams is to produce electric power in great quantities. The water is run so that it, it goes through a turbine, a great turbine. It turns at a terrific speed, and this turbine produces the electric power that uh, we use in such great quantities in this country. I'm sure you've seen these power lines going all across the country by hill and dale. We do a great deal of mining in this country, as a matter of fact, they do it in all countries. And we see a great cavern, great long hollow galleries under the surface of the earth. Well, sometimes, if nothing is done about it, these galleries collapse down there. In which case, of course, the level of the ground above is lower. And where that happens, water rushes in where there was no water before. Well, now we know that water, under control, is a powerful agency for good, but water out of control is a powerful agency for destruction. That's been proved many times over in many lands. And it's the reason why in this country we've spent billions of dollars for flood control in order to save life and property damage. Another thing, when we build a great dam for irrigation or for water supply purposes, we have to put in a lot of machinery uh, to uh, put this water uh, where we want it at the right time. And that's why we have powerful pumps and great gates and huge valves. And of course, we have to bring it from the reservoir to where we want it sometimes as much as 100 miles to a great city at a distance, and then deliver it to the individual houses, so that when you want the water, all you do is reach out and turn on a tap, like this. And we use water in endless ways in all our industry and our commerce. Let's step into a steel factory for a minute. We know that we use water there to produce steam, but we also use it in vast quantities for cooling purposes.
In fact, there isn't a, an art or a science or an industry that doesn't use water and a great deal of it in many ways in producing whatever type of good that industry or art uh, turns out. When we water our flowers or take a shower or go swimming or go sailing or any of another dozen ways in which we use it. And while we are using and enjoying it, let's remember this about water. It's essential to life. It's abundant in nature, but let's keep in mind the time, the money, and the labor that's spent to produce our great water supply system. We first moved out here because we wanted a garden free of uh, chemical uh, fertilizers, insecticides, herbicides. We wanted to raise things organically. I planted fruit trees. We set up these fences for uh, chickens, uh, pigs, sheep, and of course the geese, which are really the only remaining livestock I have. When the water problem came up, I just lost interest. It looks as though we might as well have moved into the middle of a sewer. Well, the morning with the uh, cup of tea and, uh, you know, I'd been accusing Rita of not rinsing the cups or uh, not washing them clean or changing brands. And uh, I, I decided that I was going to check the water finally. And I went into the kitchen, poured a glass of water or, or ran it out of the tap and then smelled it immediately. And uh, it had a sharp, acrid odor, which after five minutes would dissipate. If you let that same glass of water sit for five minutes, there was no discernible odor. But if you poured it, and while it was still fizzing a bit from being poured, catch the odor, it was definitely there. And uh, that's when I called the four kids and my wife in, and I said, nobody drinks this water until we have it checked. You don't brush your teeth with it, you don't cook with it. I had noticed it prior to Frank I had noticed an odor when I was doing the dishes and a feel with the water. It was a certain feeling. It had an oily, oily feel. But I thought perhaps it was something, you know, defective in the pipes or I really, I couldn't explain it, you know, and I thought, well, it'll pass and it didn't. And then I had noticed when I was showering that I would get very dizzy. I didn't, uh, I didn't think it was the, you know, the water that was doing it. I just thought I was feeling badly myself. And um, well, there were, you know, many things that were not working right. Like if I would do certain type of cooking, things would fall apart. Oh, vegetables would turn color. They would turn black. Uh, 
those noodles would just disintegrate, completely disintegrate if I were cooking noodles. I don't just suspect that we were drinking chemicals a long time before we were aware of the contamination. I know that we were. Our dental uh, record got to be absolutely terrible. Uh, many, many cavities. Uh, a general feeling of debilitation and, and lethargy. Lisa wound up with unidentifiable rashes. She was in Princeton Hospital in isolation for three days. The doctors didn't know what the hell was wrong with her. Now, it's entirely possible. Lisa, being the youngest, being fair-skinned, was more susceptible to uh, rash than the rest of the family. So one certainly has to suspect the landfill. When I first got to know Mr. Jones, he took me on a tour and showed me what a nice, clean, safe operation he was running. Then he pointed over toward Teddy Cordes' property and he said, you see that house over there? Don't have anything to do with that fella. He's some kind of a nut. Teddy Cordes also has a contaminated well. We observed in our coffee and tea such a, a multicolor, uh, rainbow color of water on top. We have a feeling then, uh, that we are dirty people. We didn't wash good enough our dishes. And that was, uh, you know, bad feeling. And yet, uh, we try to wash better, same effect. And at this moment, you can plant Keller and say they how bad the his water is. So naturally, we have the answer.
He said, Frank, anything I can do to help, even fight. I have no fear because I always say, if I survive other Hitler, it's concentration camp. We have been working in chemical factories. Now. Showed them the report and talked to them about it. Kind of scared me. He, he, he gave him a glass of it and sort of scared me when he says, he says, I think your wood is polluted. I went to uh, Earl Lewis. I got a copy here somewhere from the fellow down the corner here. He gave me a copy of uh, the results of the tests in this area, so I have that. And uh, I went to Donald Jones and told him about it. I was the one who notified. I said, Frank, what are we going to do? And he says, I've got to tell these people. He says, I'm going to lose myself if I didn't. And he said, I said something about you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble. He says, I don't give a damn. How could I sit here and let these people? Some kind of chemical, probably sulfuric acid. All white houses changed to the black color. Yeah. It was a very big commotion. Our neighbors have been complaining. Nobody did nothing. 
there were several DEP officials down, and uh, for a long time they had been sort of, I felt, badgering with me with this sort of thing. Mr. Kaler, are you sure you didn't do anything to pollute your own well? And I said, you know, you've asked me this at least 18 times already. Instead of bothering me, why don't you go down in there and check that truck with white powder spilling off the back? And he said, well, we have our jobs to worry about. Sort of hopeless dejection, I called the EPA labs over a thousand parts per million. What's the standard? almost bottle this uh, and use it as uh, a cleaning, cleaning fluid or, or a paint remover. <laughs> I mean, it's well, stickingly funny. It's just carbon, carbon tetrachloride, 400 parts per billion. Uh, benzene, which is a known human uh, carcinogen, 230. I, you know, I've never seen an analysis of drinking water. It's that this is that you know, chloroform, 4900. This is over 10 times. EP has ever reported in any drinking water supply. Look at the lead levels in this one well. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, it's a horrible set of numbers. I mean, these people have all uh, requested help. Uh, they've been told their wells are condemned, but we, we can't do anything for you. We'll cut out. Just willing to come to their, to their aid. Every site where landfills have existed for years is a potential problem. The seriousness of it depends upon the quantities of waste that were put in there, the proximity to homes, the proximity to groundwaters. JIS is not one in the state that we consider a very high priority problem. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Mr. Mezzi was beginning to talk in a way that uh, upset me very much. He wanted us to settle. He kept suggesting that we settle, settle, settle. Don't carry it through the court. But as time went on, I got the feeling more and more that Fred was not interested in winning a case for us. He was interested in getting out of the case and getting us out. What do you think, Betty? No, absolutely not. So we verbally agreed to settle for $10,000, but only after offering to settle. Teddy says $5. I seem to remember $1. I wanted to, to settle for $1 if the court would close the landfill. And uh, the court refused to close the landfill. They admitted that the landfill did damage the aquifer. It did poison my well. It must have poisoned my children. But maybe a thousand years from now, it'll drift away a little bit, so no harm was done and we collected nothing. We dreamed that there was justice in American courts, and we got wiped out. You talk about David and Goliath. We were so naive to fight Shell Chemical, Ortho Pharmaceutical, uh, Textron Incorporated, General Motors, General Electric, BASF, Wyandotte, Phelps Dodge. And that's a partial list of the people we filed suit against. The state did not press charges against those industries. It's never been our policy to sue companies that generate waste when they take it to a landfill that's registered for that waste, as long as the landfill itself is uh, functioning. The state allowed companies to bring the waste. I'm not saying the state's a fault. I don't think it was fault. Yeah, this landfill is still operating. The Department of Environmental Protection is still ostensibly at least trying to close it down. The materials that have been deposited in that landfill are still leaching into the ground and they will be leaching for many years so i have very little confidence in the state's ability to regulate or enforce its own regulations now if the state doesn't bite and uh, i certainly wouldn't trust industry to cite all by itself i i frankly don't know where we're going to go from there in citing we are not going to cite any site we are laying out the strategy of recommendations for the governor and the department for a process to evaluate site. I come here tonight rather, uh, some people say pessimistically, I've begun to feel that I come here with a realistic thought that these meetings don't really seem to produce any results. If we can make it more expensive to pollute than not to pollute that industry, which is very well represented here tonight, I count six uh, against, what, three or four at the conference table, uh, will, as a matter of simple self-defense, have to figure its own way out of the dilemma which it has created. We, you know, we're for and have spent money and <coughs> have led the way on a lot of environmental fights. The chemical industry does not object to spending money for sound environmental control. We are objecting to sending good money after bad because we have much better ways to use it obviously a continuing dialogue. Therefore, I want to tell you that I hope that this is not our last uh, meeting together. I have a telephone number and I would like you to write it down. It's 609-292-2885. One that's nailed down, and I still say, and I'm going to say this probably to my dying day, We've got to make it more expensive to pollute than not pollute. Unless we do it. Unless we look at that. Meanwhile, you have my phone number. You are not a good. Good. Thank you again.
I'm so excited to bring much business in the office today. There's something I can do to help you. My name is Barbara Ackerman. I'm an executive assistant. Well, perhaps there is. Uh, we came down because we have been promised. Who is we, sir? Uh, well, I'm Frank Kerr from South Brunswick. I'm a spokesman for a group of people in South Brunswick and Monroe. Uh, recently, there's been some radioactive testing done on my well and other wells in the area. And we've been promised that we would be supplied with copies of the laboratory analysis sheets and any reports. We've received nothing, so we thought we'd... First of all, I'm very sorry. If you want to come in and see Mrs. English, what I would suggest, and I would I would suggest that you always do this if you're coming down to any governmental agency or anywhere, that you call and set up an appointment, because what we try to do is be very responsive. I understand. And what, you know, I'm not used to someone coming in to see the boss and having, you know, do I stand and wave and say, hello, folks. I met Jerry English so, last spring. At, please uh, turn that off. At Governor Burns' toxic task force meeting, and uh, she told me. Excuse personally, me, would you like to come with me, sir? Sure. Excuse me, we'll be right with you. And I was then dragged behind closed doors and told that one must make an appointment, that this was not the way things were done, that one must not arrive unannounced. I told the woman that I had called several times with no results. Okay. All right, action. Put the thing on action. Ready to shake hands? Okay. okay. We'll be right with you. Okay. <laughs> Have fun. Why don't you sit down and read our magazine? I was herded into still another room man who said he was an atomic scientist attempted to convince me that the amounts of radioactivity found in my well and in my neighbor's wells was not harmful. I showed him the federal standards and asked him why, if the federal people say the water was dangerous, the state still maintained that it was not harmful. He said that the federal standards were very conservative, implying that the federal people were inaccurate and the state knew that. Children are, without doubt, drinking radioactive water at this time, and the state says we wash our hands of it. I'm concerned because the people across the road in Monroe Township are still not hooked up to municipal water. Unfortunately, one half of the street is located, the residents are located in South Brunswick, and the other half of the uh, residents across the street are located in Monroe Township. South Brunswick did offer the lineup with respect to Monroe Township picking up part of the bill for the installation of the water line. And I don't think an agreement was reached to have Monroe hook up to the municipal water supply. Money aside, what about the health of the carting water for six years now. Looks like we're going to have a long wait today. Hello. Fine. Everybody's decided to get water at the same time. Huh? Oh, no. Fine. Yeah, we meet at the old water house. Okay, we're almost done. Yeah. Then we'll be we have to wait for you to get to the water. Yeah. Carting water now. Stick a bit. Prior to this happening, I think the DEP almost worked on a crisis intervention type of a, a program. Now they're on a continual monitoring program. Uh, I believe the time span is a sample every six months. I have not seen anybody for a year and a half to two years. Now it seems to me somewhere along the line I should have uh, been seen somebody at least once if, if they came every six months. Frank came with an apple. He's got a hand to that Every time they got knocked down, Right now we're at Monroe Township heading down toward Jamesburg. The groundwater flows in a direction from my house directly toward Jamesburg. And the pollution is beginning to show up in wells all the way down the line.
they're not doing anything to find out when this will hit James Berg, uh, when it's going to start affecting hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Incidentally, here's I have ideas nursery uh, with the two wells that were bad enough to report. Uh, we had a little trouble with the well over here, you know, the spring. He was getting a lot of sand. It's uh, some chemical or something, he eat him up. Well, when it get bad, we got to do something. We can't stay like this. We got to drink the water. Well, if I have the Diaz wells came up bad, that means necessarily that the uh, <laughs> private wells in the area have to be contaminated, too. Uh, sure, for our health and for uh, for our own child. Four years old, he'll be around a lot longer than we will be. The lethargic, just sick feeling. We get that a lot. We've talked about that quite a bit. Some of the homeowners meetings, people think, you know, question, could it be something in the water? The last time they came down, they did find uh, metals. I think they found lead and zinc in, the, in our water. Uh, but it was levels that were small enough that they considered at that time that was acceptable to drink. Yeah, it has chemicals in it. From Jones house, we have to drink cream soda. We just hope it doesn't seep up this way. As far as we know, it hasn't yet. We've been here for 20 years. I'll tell you, it makes there wonderful was, tea. Was, if you have water that makes good tea, you've got good water, and our, our water makes good tea. People say, well, my water doesn't smell bad. It, it tastes good to me. And I have to keep reminding these people that Teddy Cordes water, which was proved to have Chloroform, uh, trichloroethane, trichloroethylene had no discernible odor to whatsoever, not to me or to anyone else. And I haven't, uh, I haven't had any problem. Well, I, I can't really, you know, make any waves because it, it's not affecting me, see? But if it ever does, then I'm going to have to really do something, especially here. I'll blow this whole business. Oh, my God. Right here. Mr. Lewis, his wells are good. They don't want to face it. Why? I have no idea. I can't believe that they realize what they're doing and they could still do it. Uh, they're unthinkingly sacrificing the safety of their family, their children, to protect the value, you know, the, this mythical thing, of a piece of real estate. We went to all these people and we said, look, we've got a big problem here. They were not interested. They're child perhaps dying from leukemia 15 or 20 years from now, that doesn't count. It's not immediate enough. If there was, if it was a hands-down approach saying, well, there's no question that these, these compounds uh, have health significance, then I'd be the first to say, regardless of the cost, we've got to do it. But as soon as you say, well, there's, there's a chance that or whatever other health implication, then you have to look at the economic uh, impact of it. And that's where we are today, the water industry, EPA, and all the health authorities. No, there is no basis for, quote, warning our population, hey, excuse me, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, because it's just plain not true. We do not have, in general, across the board, a problem with our groundwater. Oh, you'd be amazed what people from all over come I, here. I, I, and the water steams from? Is that bad? Horrible. It smells like polluted water. It tastes like polluted water. Yeah, there's so many different chemicals in the water. Democracy in his back. I eat my back. This is my back. What they're telling you 
don't dump in my backyard. You know, go somewhere else, okay? And it is hard, extremely hard, to work reasonably with any community in this state at this time when you are coming to the point of resolving a disposal problem. In Elizabeth, they have a facility that stored thousands upon thousands of barrels of hazardous waste. I heard they were having a public meeting, so I decided to go up. I thought maybe I could tell them some of the problems we run into and maybe suggest ways that they can uh, hit some of those problems off. I'm shaking. I'm very scared. I have to breathe this air every day. I don't know what's going to happen to me at the end of the year from breathing this air. I'd like to know. I just want to know what the all is doing now. In what regards, sir? I told you that I would monitor that for air pollution violations. Okay, act on me. If you feel better doing that, you got the job. I no, sir. I you do got not. The job. You got the job. Do your not. job. There's always action. Do, do your, your job. job. Do your job. You're absolutely right. And we right. wouldn't have to spend it. The power is not with the EP, EPA, it's with us with all of us. We are what's going to make or break the future of this country. We will determine it. I would suggest to each one of you, as you read the newspapers and you see a comment, you see a name, and you don't like what that man said in the newspaper, you call DEP, you call EPA. Don't buckle under. There was a toxic time bomb last night of went off, exploding into a gigantic fireball, lighting up the sky along the major highways and waterways of New Jersey and Staten Island. The lights in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Immediately, I thought of it must have been the spot that Frank had visited last year. It was unbelievable I mean, what was happening. Well, the cleanup process was moving along at a stable space for the time bomb captivity. Because the state's been dragging his feet. You know that. Everybody knows it. Governor Byrne arrived after much of the danger was passed. He told reporters the state had to move slowly in cleaning up the site because each of the 40,000 barrels has to be evaluated on how dangerous it is to move. Authorities say there are at least 2,000 sites throughout the United States, probably more, that fit the same description. They are all a full time bomb. You don't pick up the paper any, any time, I mean, every day, you so see something pertaining to some nasty pollution. The fact that 10 million other wells may be polluted in the United States doesn't make me feel any better about our wells. It really doesn't change anything as far as these kids and this family is My legs and teeth, bones, okay. four separate stress fractures during my during school and uh, running. When we started thinking about the water, that Joan had been drinking this water with this carcinogen that she was carrying, we said, well, you know, maybe that's, that's the reason. He was born in January of 78 was diagnosed 13 months later with leukemia. I mean, they didn't even make an attempt to let people know that this kind of stuff was even stored there and that it, it had seeped seep into the uh, water supply. Uh, you're so frustrated. There's nothing you can do. Children are going to die someday in this area because bureaucrats are patients. We go back to 1956 and I could uh, bring you up to date with, with travesties that have occurred in South Rosa Township that have permitted these sorts of conditions to exist today. This is not conjecture on my part. These are not things I have imagined for the past five years. These are things I have seen and experienced and suffered from. So don't tell me that, that uh, there is no one in government, whether on a 
local or a national level who is not kowtowing to industrial interests. For some of us are not responsible for it. I'm sure mistakes were made in the past, but you know that we have spent an awful lot of money correcting mistakes that we recognize and that we have identified for the last couple of years. When I went down to testify in Washington, a friend of mine said, why bother? They know everything you're going to tell them anyway. I said, well, at least this way they'll know what happens to a private American citizen when he runs into a problem like this. The absolute helplessness that the private citizen is subjected to. Well, we were using and buying spring water, and then the price got so high out in the local uh, supermarkets where we live that, uh, you know, you just, and in the summertime, it's very difficult to keep these gallon jugs. Yeah, now the price of spring water might be high, but the price of cancer surgery is yeah, a hell of a lot high. But lot that's high. why some of my fish died, to get these burns on their body. They've been dying out of it. No problem. Yeah, you're drinking and stuff? Wow. Well, I drink as little water as possible. I like Washington, D.C., next stop. This is Mr. Frank Taylor of New Jersey. Perhaps it's largely as a result of your effort. My understanding is the state of New Jersey now has a policy whereby there is no landfill operation in the state which is currently um, eligible to receive industrial or hazardous waste. There are no landfill operations accepting hazardous waste. Well, well, I'd really like to know where the hazardous waste is going. Uh, uh, not just piling up now, uh, someone's getting rid of it somewhere. Else. That's, that's well, that problem. goes to the whole question of illegal dumping. Fine. I, I don't believe that uh, JIS land for today is authorized to accept hazardous material. But I'll quote a DEP employee just a week and a half or so ago who said, but who is there to watch it? We had... Um a gentleman come and testify before our committee, I believe, who was talking about groundwater supplies being contaminated from that facility. There'll be no, no more wells being poisoned. There'll be no more dumping in any sort of a landfill. Fully half of the wastes in America are going to end up in places like sanitary landfills after the promulgation of federal regulations. The very wastes that we're paying to clean up have been dropped from our regulations. We're not regulating those wastes. So they, they, those very same wastes can be disposed of all over again. We'll be regulating uh, a very, very substantial proportion of the hazardous waste once our regulations are promulgated in, in April. And, and over time, as we learn more about the problem, as we get more information, we will be expanding, refining, tightening, sharpening, and perfecting that regulatory structure. What about the people who will be affected in the meantime? In my opinion, EPA and the administration do not want to regulate industrial disposal of hazardous waste. People started being told to change the regulations, and these changes were being made on political grounds. In some cases, the scientific uh, data that they provided was removed by their superiors because they didn't feel it adequately uh, supported the political decisions that have been made. Unless this lack of will and attitude is changed, any money or positions added to EPA's budget for hazardous waste management is wasted. The industries that have already been regulated uh, don't want to be regulated anymore. Say now, I've been planning that sort of thing for years, and uh, of course I don't. I don't have the the means of documenting the feelings I have from the things I've seen happen. People don't take their garbage can and dump it over the neighbor's fence because they know they'll be held liable. That's right, and it's very controversial taking on big companies. Oh, I take on the big companies. <laughs> okay, they can spread money around faster than you can spread around honestly. This hazardous waste issue is a test. A major test uh, uh, of this country and the government of this country as to whether the people are stronger than the large corporations and can get.
get the government to protect them instead of the corporations. My name is Frank Kaler. I live in South Brunswick, Middlesex County, New Jersey. I'd like to thank this committee for having given me the opportunity to testify here today about the problems I've had in the case involving the pollution of the aquifer. My well became polluted as a result of uncontained leachate from an adjacent landfill, which was licensed by the state of New Jersey and regulated by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. The township, county, and state all told me that there was nothing wrong with my water, but one sniff of the samples which I have provided for you will, I am sure, convince you that I was justified in my complete lack of confidence in official confidence or sincerity. One finds that industry through the landfill with the explicit permission of the government polluted my well. And under the present system, which is heavily loaded in favor of industrial interests, as opposed to private citizens individually or in groups, I was almost totally legally impotent. I am forced to the conclusion that there was no equity in our courtroom because I did not have enough money to pay for it. For under the present system, equity is a very high priced commodity. There appears to be an unspoken but clearly understood law that the public shall be allowed a good enough environmental quality to survive and produce without being driven to the wall of rebellion. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator Muskie. I appreciate that statement uh, very much. I want to commend you for your assistance. It isn't easy as an individual citizen to come down here at your own expense and speak your piece, spoken it, spoken it well. I come. Thank you very much, Mr. Kidd. I'm grateful to you for your appearance here today and your testimony. Uh, the people that lived in the area um, that did get a petition up back when they first started dumping in Love Canal, and they presented it to the city. And the city started eating up the swimming pools in the yard, in the, in the drum started. We had the same sort of thing, constantly replacing faucets and pipes and valves.
According to the EPA, the San Jacinto River Waste Pit Superfund site is an old dump site for paper mill waste that was created in the 1960s. The site subsided and now most of it is underwater and subject to the flow of the San Jacinto River. The site has released dioxin and other toxic pollutants into the San Jacinto River and Galveston Bay for the past 50 years. Because of the dioxins that have already been released into the river in Galveston Bay, it is recommended that for all species of catfish, spotted sea tr trout, and blue crab, adults should limit consumption to no more than one 8-ounce meal per month, and children under 12 and women of childbearing age should not consume spotted sea trout, blue crabs, or any catfish species from this area. The toxic site is frequently completely submerged under the waters of the San Jacinto River. The site remains extremely vulnerable to leaking more toxic dioxin into the water if and when the next major hurricane hits the Houston area. The site is clearly visible from Interstate 10 when crossing the San Jacinto River if you were to look to the north.
in the world. Fifteen miles from downtown Houston, in the San Jacin River, is one of the most toxic waste dumps. in the world. Children under 12 and women of childbearing age should not consume spotted sea trout, blue crabs, or any catfish species from this area. The toxic site is frequently completely submerged under the waters of the San Jose River. The site remains extremely vulnerable to leaking more toxic dioxin into the water if and when.
polluters responsible are still trying to dodge a significant part of the cleanup job. Our Greg Rugen has been out front on this story for years now and joins us live in the newsroom with the newest development. Greg. Jonathan, this latest maneuver has all the signs of major corporations kicking the financial can down the road. Trouble is, our next storm season is less than three months away, and this giant pile of toxic waste remains dangerously exposed. The numbers are staggering. More than a half billion pounds of cancer-causing dioxin waste, first dumped in the 60s and then deserted on the banks of the San Jacinto River. In 2017, after a decade of desperate community outcry, the Environmental Protection Agency ordered the company for the toxins to fund a complete cleanup. Five years later, an international paper, along with waste management, are quietly lobbying the EPA to let them break their pledge to dig up all the toxin and haul it away. You don't stop and say, I don't think we can clean it up because we've actually found that there's more waste. You address the additional contamination found. That's Jackie Young Medcap of the Texas Health and Environment been a dozen years spearheading this fight. She says recently completed sampling of the toxic dump revealed dioxin waste buried 30 feet deep, increasing the amount for excavation by 50% to 20,000 truckloads. Enough is enough. EPA, we need you to hold firm. Our community, the future of Galveston Bay, and the surrounding environment hinges on the cleanup of this site. Dangerously exposed to hurricanes and floods, the Superfund site has already sustained serious damage from a series of storms. Experts fear a direct hit could spread dioxin for miles inland and harshly contaminate large portions of Galveston Bay. Local residents like Bobby Stone, with decades of exposure, fear for their health. When I was growing up as a kid, we played out there because we didn't know. And there's a lot of people that played out there because they didn't know, and they're starting to come back on them now. I know quite a few people that have died down there from different cancers. Resident Greg Moss says he can figure only one reason those responsible for the pollution are so reluctant to pay. I think it's just all corporate greed that they're not interested in spending the money to do it right. Greg Moss tells us his dog just died from lung cancer. We checked. And that condition is extremely rare among canines. Meantime, Waste Management, International Paper, and the EPA have not yet responded to our requests for comment. We will keep you posted. In the newsroom, Greg Rubin, Fox 26 News.
one point I'm telling EPA that the kids are getting onto that field because you can see the imprints of the baseball way to make money on Amazon is not with physical. I've studied and pondered history more than any other time in my life. And one thing I've found is it's the people that are willing to get things done by any means necessary that do the greatest harm to society. And the rest of the population is there to deal with the aftermath. Welcome to Harris County, Texas. Home of the largest number of EPA Superfund sites in the state. The EPA has what they call a National Priorities List and Superfund Alternative Approach Sites. Texas has a total of 70 of these that are either current, proposed, are now deleted, and Harris County alone has 16 of the 70. By comparison, Dallas and Bear Counties each only have four. My first stop today is at the Sykes Disposal Pits. This was designated as a Superfund site around the year 1979. It operated as an illegal open dump from 1961 to 1967, hundreds of drums of chemicals and many more bulk loads were disposed containing benzene, phenols, and other contaminants, likely from nearby petrochemical companies. This site is regularly flooded by the San Jacinto River. From 1983 to 1995, large quantities of chemicals and contaminated soil were removed. According to the website, cumulus.epa.gov, since completion of the remedy, vegetation has become reestablished and the majority of the site is now vacant, except for the Love Marina at the western side of the site and an off-roading park called Down South Off-Road Park is located within the site on the north end. This ain't the Garden of Eden, but that old serpent just might be around here somewhere. Next door to Sykes Disposal Pits is French Limited. This was designated as an EPA Superfund site around the same time. It was used for sand mining operations from 1950 to 1965, then used for petrochemical waste disposal from 1966 to 1972. From 1989 to 94, 
Excavation and treatment of contaminated soil took place. Next door to a retirement community is the Crystal Chemical Company Superfund site. They produce toxic herbicides here from 1968 to 1981. The soil and groundwater became polluted with arsenic. Site cleanup began in the 1990s. Last but not least is the U.S. Oil Recovery Superfund site here in the town of Pasadena, which consists of two properties, an inactive used oil processor and a wastewater treatment facility. The former wastewater treatment plant was owned by the city of Pasadena. The EPA has removed large quantities of benzene, contaminated sludge, and contaminated stormwater, and also removed waste from many tanks and containers on the site. I have to tell you, the smell is strong here. I don't want to stay here very long. get when you mix a toxic waste dump with a flood prone area where hurricanes are common. A recipe for disaster. hard to imagine now, but this was once one of the most desirable neighborhoods in the city. When Brownwood was developed, starting in the 1930s, the land here was dry and rose high above the surrounding water. The lush, expansive lots were marketed to executives at Baytown's large refinery, and its waterfront location made it an attractive place for families to buy. By the end of the 1950s, there were more than 400 homes here. Unlike most of Baytown, Brown would lead an upper middle class. It was, by accounts of the residents, an idyllic place to grow up. Kids spent their summers exploring the banks of the bay and bicycling down the meandering streets of the subdivision. It would ironically be the refineries that would eventually lead Brownwood to its demise. Through much of the 20th century, a climate of loose regulation and environmental ignorance led the industries and municipalities in Southeast Texas to pump groundwater without restraint. Much of the Gulf Coast, not just Brownwood, sank in some places by as much as 15 feet. The peninsula that had once separated Brownwood from the channel became an island, perhaps the first sign of the way things were headed. After Hurricane Carla in 1961, it became clear that something was wrong. New construction was halted as doubts about the subdivision arose. The area had grown increasingly flood prone over the previous few decades. Residents who were used to staying through hurricanes found themselves trapped in their homes. 
Over time, docks and bulkheads had to be raised as they sank slowly into the water. Even trees began to die as the brackish water of the bay poisoned their root systems. Determined, the residents of Brownwood brought in Phil and even constructed pumps and levees in an effort to protect their once dry neighborhood. The neighborhood's grandeur was in peril, but many residents stayed. As time went on, however, the land would continue to subside. It no longer took a tropical storm to flood the subdivision. Now, even in clear weather tides, water could inundate the low-lying homes, and the future of Brownwood was a serious question. Hurricane Alicia in 1983 was Brownwood's death nail. Groundwater pumping had been stopped by this point, but for Brownwood, it was too late. After evacuating for the storm, many of the residents weren't allowed to occupy their homes, and in the years after, Brownwood became a haven of looting and dumping. Only a handful of people remained in the subdivision to keep an eye on the abandoned homes and streets. Expansive custom homes sat empty and left to rot. Baytown's most desirable subdivision had become a wasteland. Faced with a public nuisance and safety risk, the city began buying out the landowners. What remained of the homes were torn down, and even the most stubborn owners who had stayed through all the storms were eventually forced to sell. Ten years later, the city opened a nature center here that remains to this day. Not much is left of Old Brownwood. Many of the streets have completely overgrown here that remains to this day. This with a public nuisance and safety risk, the city began buying out the landowners. What remained of the homes were torn down, and even the most stubborn owners who had stayed through all the storms were eventually forced to sell. Ten years later, the city opened a nature center here that remains to this day. Not much is left of old Brownwood. Many of the streets have completely overgrown or sank below the water. Even the docks and bulkheads that once lined the shore are barely visible today. Occasionally, you find a solid reminder of the neighborhood's old life. There are still manhole covers, the sewers below long filled. The ditches that once drained water to the bay now lie perpetually full of brackish water. A few slabs remain. You can see where walls once stood, and even tile from a shower, whose vibrant color long outlasted the home that once contained it. You can imagine the life that once occupied the knolls and shores of Brownwood, but today it lies as a reminder of just how wrong a place can go. This area actually used to be a subdivision. In this recreated wetland, you find the typical water and waterfowl but you'll also find artifacts that serve as a reminder of what once was. Manholes, a telephone pole, a house foundation, tile, brick. But just how did human activity sink this place and turn it from neighborhood to nature center? The Brownwood neighborhood was founded by executives of Umble Oil, which would later merge with Exxon. At its peak, around 1,500 residents lived in Brownwood. The peninsula Brownwood sat on was surrounded by the Burnett, Scott, and Crystal Bays. Residents loved the view that came with the waterfront property, but they soon began to notice that those very bays were creeping into their backyards. Between 1906 and 1983, this area sank 10 feet. The subsidence, or sinking of the land, was mostly due to excessive groundwater extraction. Land in the southeastern United States is made up of sand, gravel, and clay. Too much groundwater removal compacts these sediments in an irreversible way. As a result, these layers are able to store less water and land elevation decreases. Subsidence is a natural process, but it's normally on a small scale and takes a long time. It's human activity that speeds up and exacerbates the sinking of the land. The oil industry was and still remains vital to Baytown's development. The city's growth was spurred by the discovery of oil and establishment of a refinery. The growth of Umbo oil in the Baytown area led to an increasing demand for groundwater. 
Groundwood being on a peninsula in close proximity to the refinery and baytown caused it to sink at a rapid rate. With the decreasing elevation, Groundwood became more prone to flooding. Storms and high tides hit the area harder, making it more difficult to live there. Hurricane Alicia hit the neighborhood hard in 1983. Rebuilding was possible, but with conditions only getting worse and the cost of damages racking up, the city declared Brownwood a hazard to live in. Residents were forced to leave their homes and their properties were bought out by FEMA. After some development, the area became the Baytown Nature Center. The water is now welcome and home to marsh and wetlands wildlife. I am delighted that they have done this to this area. It's kind of a bittersweet thing to come down here and see it, but it's okay. It's okay from what has been made out of this area down here. And it's, uh, I'm hoping that the district will still bring the children down here because it's a very important part of Baytown. Brownwood was just one extreme case of subsidence. It was beginning to be understood how widespread the issue really was. An article titled Disaster Part 2 Houston, published in 1974, reported on not just Brownwood, but how the whole Houston area was sinking due to the petrochemical industry using 190 billion gallons of water per year. Worry grew over the region's increasing vulnerability to hurricanes. The harris galveston Subsidence District was created in 1975 to reduce groundwater usage and slow subsidence. This graph shows how land compaction after 1975 greatly slowed from its previously sharp increase. Oil production, though a major user, of course isn't the only reason water is pumped from aquifers. Subsidence districts work to conserve water usage across the board and encourage using a mix of groundwater and surface water. Once the sediments have compacted, it can't be undone. And even after taking steps to reduce groundwater usage, the land will continue to sink before it adjusts. Residents of Brownwood experienced firsthand the impact. Oil production, though a major user, of course isn't the only reason water is pumped from aquifers. Subsidence districts work to conserve water usage across the board and encourage using a mix of groundwater and surface water. Once the sediments have compacted, it can't be undone. And even after taking steps to reduce groundwater usage, the land will continue to sink before it adjusts. Residents of Brownwood experience firsthand the impact human action can have on the landscape and those that live on it. Awareness of our consumption of resources is vital to ensure the future of not just humans, but all life on Earth. Hear about Texas. This is Channel 13. I would. It's paradise to Brownwood residents. That was back before hurricanes Carla and Alicia. And today, that Baytown Peninsula is paradise to migrating birds who are heading to South America from Canada. Elma Barrera is standing by live right now at what is now the Baytown Nature Center with more. Elma? Exactly. Remember the Brownwood subdivision? Well, this is it. I'm standing right on it. This area used to be covered with homes. Just to give you an idea of where we are, there's Baytown in the background with the smokestacks. And to the west of us, the San Jacinto Monument. So this is now a nature center, a wetlands area that helps birds with their migrations. Remember Brownwood in 1983 after Hurricane Alicia? Houses destroyed, rising water and subsidence. After a long and bitter battle, the city of Baytown bought them out and residents moved on. The land sat, and from that emerged a life-saving master plan. Mother Nature has been very quick to reclaim this land, and I think that's probably what has inspired a lot of us uh, to work towards it becoming a nature center. From there, the dream took flight. In the last 10 years, Baytown has developed the wetlands to continue what Mother Nature started. People don't realize, I don't think, how just, just how many species of birds we we can see here and, and have here and that need our habitats in order to survive because they have to come we can see here and, and have here and that need our habitats 
in order to survive because they have to come after those long flights they lose a lot of a lot of energy a lot of fat stores and then they they feed in these areas after resting the birds gather enough strength to fly across the gulf of mexico to central and south america to the rainforests it is also a dream come true for bird watchers we can see more species of birds here in a in a year than any place else in north america that's the upper coast six counties included here in the nature center six different kinds of birds on the endangered species list have been spotted and this is only the beginning. This is brand new. That's just a, a nursery grasslands right there. And like I said, in just just a matter of a few years, it'll it'll be a, a full marsh. And the nature center is also used for breeding crabs, shrimp, and the like. And like you can see, it's also used for fishing by the public. Reporting live, I'm Alma Barrera, 13 Eyewitness News. From KHOU TV Houston in the spirit of Texas, this is 11 News at 5. As folks in North Carolina begin the cleanup from Hurricane Bonnie, people here are still remembering Hurricane Alicia 15 years ago. Charles Hadlock tells us about a Baytown neighborhood that disappeared after Alicia, but is now taking on a new and very different life. The 